Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, budget debates are always interesting occasions for a number of reasons. It's an occasion for a government to display its ministerial talents. It's an opportunity for members to share their philosophies, their beliefs, expectations, wax eloquently, and of course to speak of their ministries and their policies. Crucially, it is also an opportunity for members to highlight their constituencies and in some circumstances to share their secrets with the rest of us. Secrets sometimes we may not even be aware of, but nevertheless we welcome and we are happy for these individual members. Most importantly, we are all on display to the people of St. Lucia as they cast their judgments on our individual performances. It is an exciting time, Mr. Speaker, in the parliamentary calendar. It is truly parliamentary theatre and how much of that we have had in the past 24 hours. I remember Sir John in his first and last budget presentation after the 2006 general elections in an obvious attempt at mischief and mirth, remarking that a highlight for him was the attire of some members of the then House. I believe that on that occasion he spoke specifically of the splendor of the attire of the member for Vieux North. And of course also the member, the then member for Denry North as well. We all, I remember, erupted into laughter, Mr. Speaker. That helped to diffuse the tension which was laden and was very heavy. But Mr. Speaker, I take a moment to commend the people of St. Lucia. I am frankly astonished by the number of St. Lucians at home and abroad who listen to the presentations. I used to think we politicians bored them to death. They were fed up of us, they were fed up of our gymnastics. But that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Even more intriguing are the numbers online, some of whom, of course, as you know, engage in very robust debates, depending on the individual they support, or, of course, the particular political party that they endorse, or, for that matter, the argument that they find favorable. When I look back, I think that the decision many years ago to televise meetings of the House have paid huge dividends, even at the cost of fewer persons, or in fact, no persons at all, joining us in the chamber to follow our proceedings. I say this not with any degree of disappointment, Mr. Speaker, but to say that we were just in time for this electronic revolution that has occurred when major adjustments were made by all in terms of how we received, how we handled, and how we disseminated information. So Mr. Speaker, all is on display. Attire, ties, speech craft, wit, parliamentary mannerisms and, and styles, all of that is on display and available for commentary. It is also an occasion when choice political language is utilized. I'm sure that some revisit vocabularies in preparation for this debate to make sure these days that they have the right pronunciation because there's always dictionaries available to facilitate this process. But of course, too, it is an occasion to 
carefully select your arguments and to insert in the political discourse that takes place specific items to provoke, to invite, to admonish, to cause pain, and of course, if you prefer the lighter side of it, discomfort. And so this morning, Mr. Speaker, as I prepared for my turn at, the, my turn at this lectern, I had just about enough chance to hear my dear friend, the member for Swazel Solibus, speak of the Sanders matter, admonishing members on the government side about continuing to mention the fact that some $24 million in tax were um, cancelled for the Sanders chain. Now, Sanders is a very sensitive subject, Mr. Speaker, always a sensitive subject. But the Honorable Member inserted this, and I have always said in my conversations with him, and I've always told him, that you know, whenever he is going to invoke my name, he must tread with a lot of caution. He must be careful that he dots his I's, he crosses his T's, and if he does that, then he can be assured that all will be well. But unfortunately, I don't know because of whether it is because of the advice he received, the direction he got, he did not listen to what a friend had voluntarily offered to him to be careful, to tread carefully. And so he mentioned me in, um, as he referred to a press release issued by the Sanders chain. Mr. Speaker, I must take the opportunity to respond because you see, I have issued very few press releases since 2016. I have issued press releases mainly where my constituency is concerned. And you find most of my press releases have been on subjects pertaining to, to my constituency. But when the Sanders press release came out, I did issue a press release because I found the release particularly egregious. And I want Mr. Speaker to touch briefly this press release to, to which I am referring to and of course to give the Honorable Member from Suzel a copy to remind him of what was said. I'll tell you what I found very egregious in the press release. It was the following paragraph in the statement issued by Sanders. Quote, since the former prime minister was fully aware of the circumstances surrounding this matter, it is very unfortunate that members of his party are among those being allowed to consistently misrepresent this issue to the public of St. Lucia. Sanders never and does not owe the government of St. Lucia any outstanding money. Rather, this dispute with inland revenue over withholding taxes on insurance premiums was an old and exceptional matter that required resolution if Sanders was able to finance new investments on the island. Indeed, the only purpose served by delaying it was to have derailed the expansion works that were planned for the Sanders Grand St. Lucia. That particular part. And of course, up to now, I don't think to those works that are spoken about or all the works that have taken place, but put that aside for the time being, because we know there were other issues involved, including legal challenges. This paragraph contained, in my view, two insinuations which I totally reject as completely false. The first is a suggestion that despite my knowledge of the circumstances surrounding this matter, I am one of those allowing members of the St. Lucia Liberal Party, among others, to consistently misrepresent the issue. Secondly, I was one of those involved in delaying the resolution of the issue, and this served the purpose to derail the expansion works that were planned for the Sanders Grand St. Lucia. I pointed out that these two statements in their imputations are false and highly defamatory for the following reasons. And I will very quickly go through what I said in that press release. Quote, to start with the assessment to tax was made by the Inland Revenue Department. The revenue laws of St. Lucia provide for challenges to any assessment by any taxpayer 
who is aggrieved by an assessment or determination by the controller of Inland Revenue. Three, as Minister of Finance, I considered it imprudent and unlawful for me or the Cabinet to intervene in the de determination of assessments by the Inland Revenue Department. Four, I was aware that Sanders had been assessed by the Inland Revenue Department for payment of withholding taxes on insurance premiums between the years 2001 to 2009 because I was approached by Mr. Richard Peter King on behalf of Sanders on the issue. My position has always been very clear that I do not and will not intervene in these matters. Consequently, I gave absolutely no undertaking to Sanders or any officer or representative of Sanders that the government which I led would intervene to resolve the complaint by Sanders in its favor. Sixthly, in all the years that I have served St. Lucia as Minister of Finance, I have never intervened to direct the Inland Revenue Department in matters of tax liability. In fact, for me, it was sacred ground. I never ever touched it. No Inland Revenue Controller could ever say I gave them directions on any taxpayer. I have always held the view that matters of tax liability between the taxpayer and the Department of Inland Revenue are sacred. No control of Inland Revenue Department could say that I have ever directed the Department to withdraw, alter, or change assessments made by the Department on any individual or corporate entity. The most that I have done is to urge a taxpayer and the Department to compromise and settle issues of liability amicably as litigation is usually a costly affair not only for the taxpayer but also for the government. Then finally, I said, if Sanders Resort International was so convinced that the professional advice which he said it received was right, then all it had to do was to appeal the decision of the control of Inland Revenue to the Income Tax Appeals Commissioners established by Section 108 of the Income Tax Act, Cap 1502. It did not. Instead, it appealed to and leverage the then government, the Shastri government, to intervene and set aside the assessment made by the Department of Inland Revenue. That was the response to the statement. Now, having said that, Mr. Speaker, let me put on record that young Adam, Adam um, Stewart draws my admiration. I watched him grow as a young man and, and develop over the years and remember my several conversations with him, sometimes in the presence of his father, about his future and what the future is likely to, to bring. I have not had the opportunity to meet him, of course, since he's been elevated following his father's death. But I just want to say that I regard him as a, a very a decent, decent young man. But there was a time, and I regret, Mr. Stewart has, has passed on to the silent continent, as a member for Labry would say. And so he may not hear my utterances today, or cannot hear my utterances. And I regret that, but I will say this. At one time, I was Mrs. Stewart's favorite prime minister in the region. I was his favorite prime minister and the best prime minister for tourism at one time. But it's no secret, the relationship fell apart. And it fell apart really for three reasons, Mr. Speaker. And now these are the reasons that I suspect is behind this rather defamatory statement. First of all, the decision by the then government that I led to enact the labor code for St. Lucia. Mr. Stewart opposed this vehemently. Why I could not understand or comprehend and that's a whole story by itself. And then, of course, that played out in the elections, of course, as you know, in 2006. The second reason that we fell out was, of course, the re-entry of Sir John Compton into the political arena, his old friend. And uh, it provided the perfect opportunity for him to redefine his loyalties. No quarrels with that, no problems with that. I understand these things. And perhaps the third thing was indeed this tax issue because he himself came to me about it with his chief tax architect at the time, 
made the request to me and I declined the request and told him that look, I am sorry I can't entertain this because I do believe that the correct procedure is to appeal to the tax commissioners, I don't get involved. The relationship then just fell apart. So when the member for Sozell introduces this issue in Parliament, when he introduces this issue, he may not have remembered the background and provides the perfect opportunity, of course, to put the record straight and clear. But I'm a man, I have no ill will, I have no malice, I don't bear any anger or hatred, I'm not accustomed to that. I like the new Sanders chairman, I think he's a very interesting young man, and it is astounding that a, a young person at that age could be given so much responsibility for an obviously, um, for an obviously a world-class product, product that has really changed tourism in the region. It's an astounding accomplishment. And so, Mr. Speaker, um, I am going to invite the member for Suzelle to engage in a little reflection and to be far more cautious when he decides to, to um, enter the arena on the basis of, of such um, statements and such events. This brings me, Mr. Speaker, to a sub-theme of my presentation this afternoon. And it had a direct reference, reference to the issue of choice of political language. And I wanted to say, Mr. Speaker, that one of the occurrences in the exchanges that take place in our parliament, in the lexicon that we utilize, are what I sometimes describe as political myths. We come to this house and we repeat things that are obvious, myths, and for want of a better term, are nothing more than political myths. These myths, Mr. Speaker, are sometimes elevated to self-evident truth. And perhaps to be clear, Mr. Speaker, what do I mean by myths in our political practice and political culture? What do you really mean, Mr. Speaker? There are several definitions of myths. The one that fits my purpose best is the one in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which says that a myth is Quote, a usually traditional story of ostensibly historical events that serves to unfold part of the worldview of a people to explain a practice, belief, or natural phenomenon. And I want to just to think in it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a worldview, it's a part of a worldview. It's part of a worldview. It seems to explain a practice, belief, or phenomenon. The more popular Wikipedia, Wikipedia says, myth is a folklore consisting of narratives that play a fundamental role in society, such as foundational tales or origin myths. Since myth is popularly used to describe stories that are not objectively true, the identification of a narrative as a myth can be highly controversial. So these are selected from the authorities as to what myths could be, etc. And of course, if I say we use myths in our political discourse, then I'm simply saying to you that you are repeating things you believe which are irrefutable truths about each other and of course the political parties you support and represent. So let me draw some conclusions, because Mr. Speaker, I don't want you to rule me out of order, and I, I know that you are listening very closely and want to find out where I'm going with this. Well, I'll get them in a few minutes. So the conclusions I would draw is that a myth is a traditional story of ostensibly historical event or event. Something existed, Mr. Speaker, to create it. It unfolds part of the worldview of a people, or we can add a society a political party, an organization, if you want. It consists of narratives that play a fundamental role. And in the case of a political party, for the political party, its projections and its arguments, its acceptance or non-acceptance, Mr. Speaker. 
and of course all the time bearing in mind and both definitions agree that it is a story that is not objectively true so when we come in this parliament and repeat and regurgitate myths mr speaker we are really repeating things that are not objectively true you know but it is convenient for us to latch on and to say it um, with such with such with such conviction so in politics mr speaker we do create our own um, folklore our own truth and as i have said before um, there's such a thing called political folklore political folklore the beliefs and things that surround the, the practice of our politics mr speaker and yes mr speaker we create myths to give meaning or ascribe value and meaning to phenomena events that are rarely as we said objectively true but mr speaker don't get me wrong myths do serve political purposes they record events or observations they give meaning they offer ready-made explanation of a phenomena they obfuscate they confuse sometimes they destroy so embedded mr speaker are these myths in the psyche of people and in their conversations that we elevate these myths to become what i said earlier are irrefutable irrefutable truths and mr speaker i am sure that if you are supporters of both political parties they will share popular beliefs and generalizations about each other which they hold to be the gospel truths ordained that's the truth to make my point mr speaker i will share with you two common generalizations that factually are really political myths which should be relegated to the dustbins of history and for and i'm going to play it safe by using two drawn from our own political party one such myth is that crime always increases under the slp because the slp is soft on crime you hear it all the time another is that the slp only cares about workers and the poor not the middle class or middle class professionals so pervasive is this latter characterization that the minister of finance was moved mr speaker at page seven of his presentation to declare quite rightly that quote this government continues to be guided and inspired by the philosophy and values of the founding fathers of our great party the st lucia labor party to open doors of opportunity for every st lucian irrespective of their social and economic standing in the society our party originated from the bosom of the labor movement and has consistently served the best interests of the workers in this country unquote and that summarizes summarizes a philosophical tenet of, of the labor party that all represent and i am certain that this particular quote will resonate for a very long time today miss today and of course in the years to come it's very well said today mr speaker i plan to address one such pervasive myth the myth that of the two political parties the united workers party is the best manager of the economy and i believe you heard the member the leader of the opposition a member for miku south um, he's not disassociating himself from that view at all i mean in fact um i think that there's muted concurrence with it i do so mr speaker because the former administration led by the member from miku south was a chief purveyor of that myth even after the defeat of 2021 and mr speaker i sat on the opposition benches in the last term as i heard the derision the the ridicule the unkind uh, remarks about the economy that was managed by the previous administration i'm i'm sure mr speaker 
Honorable members will recall some of the choice statements that were made on, on these occasions. But what was the reality, Mr. Speaker? I want to take the bold step of answering this, particularly as it concerns this budget presentation and, of course, the information that has been presented to us in the last um, few days. Let us look at the performance of the respective administrations, the Labour Party administration, led by yours truly, at one time the Honourable Member for for the South, and of course the administration led by the former Prime Minister and now leader of the opposition member, also for Miku South. I will focus initially on these key indices, growth rates, debt to GDP ratios, fiscal operations, and after we have looked at these indices, we are then going to consider how the resources of the state were utilized and already we have had pronouncements from individual members in their contributions to, the, to this house. So, the remit is simple. Who really is the best manager of, of this economy? What does the historical record say? What does the historical record provide? Who can the people of St. Lucia continue to trust to, to manage this economy, to take us to the future that, that lies ahead of us? These are the sub-themes, the sub-topics, the sub-issues, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let's first of all look at what the former Prime Minister and the member for Miku South inherited in 2016. This is what they found. And I must say, Mr. Speaker, I have not wandered very far. I didn't go into my archives because, you know, these social, economic and social reviews, I do have problems with them sometimes, um, to be honest, and I've said so when I was on the opposition benches. I go, that's not going to change. No, I do have issues with them. But I didn't go into my ar archives. I decided for the sake of simplicity to, to, use, to use this. So we are back in 2016. What was the inheritance? And we are looking at, Mr. Speaker, we are looking at the issue of growth rates. For the five-year period, the growth rate recorded during the tenure of the former St. Lucia Labour Party government was minus 0 0.1 in 2012, minus 2.0 in 2013, 2013, 1.3 in 2014, 0 0.1 in 2015, and 3.4 in 2016. I have omitted the 4.3 growth rate in 2011 because a general election, of course, the United Workers Party was then in office, because a general election was held in November of that year, and that growth rate properly belongs to the United Workers Party of the member for Castries North. But we all know what happened subsequently because the moment after that growth rate, the economy plunged, decelerated into decline. And I don't think the member for Castries North will ever dissent that this decline was partly explained by, of course, the settlement of the then wage bill. And in any event, this was the period when we engaged in some structural adjustment to better anchor the economy. And yes, we did. We introduced VAT in that period. Many will remember, of course, remember this. The growth rate of 2016 was also a shared year between the parties. But everyone knows that what was achieved in any particular year was determined by policies in the previous term. Now for the five-year period of the United Workers' Party. The growth rate recorded during the tenure of the UWP under the guidance of the member for Miku South was 3.4 in 2017, which, as you know, would have been created by the policies of 2016. 2.9 in 2018, minus 0.3 in 2019. And then we plunged precipitously to a whopping minus 25.4 in 2020, and, of course, returned to a growth of 12.2% in 2021. And, Mr. Speaker, 
I am inviting you, I think, to look at page 91, where all of these statistics appear. So you're welcome to visit page 91 to confirm that I'm not pro propagating my own myth, but rather these are statistics from, from this. Now, let me enter a caveat. And there's no need for us to fight over this, <laughs> you know? Because it's time we have to grow up in politics. You know, I, I remember, Mr. Speaker, I remember the years when we had September 11th in the US and the economies were plunged into decline. No matter how I stood on the benches on the opposite side and explained the impact this had on tourism and the damage it caused the tourism sector, I was ridiculed wrongly, not just by the then opposition, but of course by those interest groups in the society who felt that they had a shared interest in promoting the ideological interests of the then United Workers Party. So in 2011, Mr. Speaker, um, that chapter was a different chapter. So for the five year period of the United Workers Party, we have these growth rates and in particular the decline in, um, of 25.4% is directly, I wouldn't say directly, is partly attributably, attributably, partly explainable by, of course, what occurred with COVID. To be sure, as I said, Mr. Speaker, it is beyond doubt that COVID was largely responsible for this precipitous decline, but niggling questions remain. Why was the decline so severe? Why was St. Lucia the worst casualty in the OECS? And that's the niggling question. Three points may be made, Mr. Speaker. First, the United Workers Party in 2016 inherited an economy that had stabilized after the adjustments between 2011 and 2014 to introduce VAT and contain expenditure. By 2016, the economy had returned to growth, albeit tepidly, a little warm, but growth was there and that's how it starts. In 2017, when the member for Migusad was prime minister and in office, after one year the economy grew by 3.4%, and thereafter growth decelerated rapidly. And that is the, another question. Why did growth begin to decelerate after a climb of 3.4? Secondly, in 2020, Mr. Speaker, as we said, growth declined by a whopping 25.4%, the most significant decline ever in the economic history of this country, worse than Hurricane Allen in 1979. Secondly, as I said earlier, it was the most dramatic decline in OECS. It is really pointless to blame it all on COVID. We're not going to get anywhere with that argument, even when we concede that COVID had some impact, some influence. I'll tell you why. It is true that by then our economy had developed tourism as its leading sector. And it was the sector that suffered the greatest damage from the onset of COVID. But the problem is, the problem is that a country like Antigua has a similarly structured economy like ours these days perhaps with the rider that we are slightly more diversified because of the manufacturing sector, which I suspect is a little stronger or stronger than that of Antigua. And of course we have some agriculture as well, some. And you know what has happened to agriculture's contribution to GDP in this economy? So the question
question is, why is it that they never experienced such a dramatic decline and we did? And as I said, we were a more diversified economy. Now, Mr. Speaker, what reasons can you proffer for this? What reasons can you, 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 you give for this? But I leave the issue at, the, at, at large. I put it out at large. Deliberately for the time being, Mr. Speaker. Because the plan is to return to it at the appropriate time. The third point I wish to make, and I know this irritates the opposition intensely. It does irritate the opposition each time it is said. The United Workers Party administration was a beneficiary of a twice rebased economy during its tenure. Every time I say that, they get upset. Every time. And I'm on record as saying the, the St. Lucia Labour Party has never had the benefit of a rebased economy. How the civil servants manage it, I don't even know to this day. How they get it, how they get it done, I don't know, but we all welcome it. You know why, Mr. Speaker? We welcome it because it means major, major adjustments in the figures that are presented to the Honorable House. So if you had a lower growth rate in a particular year, a particular cycle, you may find that growth rate inching, you know, a couple points, a couple points, points up. But you know, Mr. Speaker, it is well known that rebasing recorded higher measurable economic output will lead to a reduction in debt to GDP ratios. So if, if you have, for example, if your GDP increases, then what it does is that it allows some readjustment on your debt to GDP ratio and perhaps even make your debt to GDP ratio looking a little better, whether of course by a couple of notches or otherwise. So it's, all, it's always welcome. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I want to stick a pin here for the sake of history, for the sake of the moment, for the sake of the hour. Mr. Speaker, I pause to say that one of the highest, if not the highest growth achieved after independence in a single year was 6.2% in 2006, achieved when the member for Beaufort South managed the economy. And I have a feeling it's higher than 6.2 because we have not got the rebase figures. I don't have access to the, re to the rebase figures, even if the Ministry of Finance suggests that they may have been rebased. But I've always known it's 6.2 before rebasing. Be that as it may. No other Minister of Finance is yet to surpass that figure in normal times. Though the omens look good for the current Minister of Finance to do so. And why do I say normal times? Simply. When an economy suffers a dramatic decline, as happened with COVID with us, you get a decline of 25.4% of or you get a hurricane that totally destroys your GDP. It is almost inevitably that once you begin to deal with the issues of recovery, you will see your growth developing by leaps and bounds. It's an inevitable process. Now, of course, they are taking sanctuary in that argument, they are taking sanctuary in that argument, and their response is, well, you know, you got a 25, you got an 18% growth rate, you got a 12, but it had to happen in any event. Attempting to deny the member for Castries is the skillful managing of the economy to have allowed room for that growth to take place. And you want to understand what I'm saying? You want to understand what you're saying? What I'm saying? Just like Mr. Speaker, when the member from Miku South held the reins of the economy, he can't explain what he did, why the economy deteriorated so alarmingly and decelerated at the pace that it did prior to the injury of COVID. So, you get the next clue. When COVID came around, this economy was already in sharp decline. It had decelerated to the point that COVID delivered to it a lethal blow because of the management of the economy by the previous Minister of Finance. That's, right. That's the reality and, and so on. The economy did not have the pillars, it did not have the crutches, Mr. Speaker, that it needed to withstand the onslaught of COVID. 
And so we all had the indignity of a decline of 25.4% or thereabouts, some say 30%, uh, Mr. Speaker. That's what in fact happened. And uh, I'm not saying that the Honorable Member should have forecasted what would have happened because we didn't expect the pandemic. But you know the problem is? Is when you begin to explain the phenomenon as an issue, you have to take responsibility and you have to take liability. It is in your explanations that become critical and crucial. Of course I would want that history. I would want that history be to, to be treated as historical phenomena. But I, we cannot do so yet because the imputation still exists. The consequences, we are all feeling it today. And it is vital that our people understand what we are dealing with. So much then, Mr. Speaker, for growth rates. Let us now take a look at public debt GDP ratios. And for that, Mr. Speaker, I want you to see page 115 of the Economic Social Review for 2022. Look at it, Mr. Speaker. Now, let us contrast and look at the ratios. Mr. Speaker, take your time. Write it down if you want, if you must. In 2012, Mr. Speaker, the debt to GDP ratio for St. Lucia was 61.1%. In 2013, it was 62.2%. In 2014, it was 60.7%. In 2015, it was 61.5%. And remember, Mr. Speaker, I am looking at page 115 of the Economic and Social Review. These are not figures I am inventing, Mr. Speaker. These are not myths, Mr. Speaker. These are raw figures. In 2016, Mr. Speaker, the debt to GDP ratio stood at 60.9%. Sixty point nine percent. Now these figures are fascinating, Mr. Speaker. And I pause to ask who was the Minister of Finance in 2015, going into 2016, one. But Mr. Speaker, the reality is that when you look at the figure of 60.9 percent, St. Lucia had virtually satisfied the benchmark of the debt to GDP ratio of 60% set by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank set a benchmark of 60% for the debt to GDP ratio of its member countries. And when I left office in 2016, St. Lucia had basically achieved that benchmark of 60.9%. And I don't care whether they're saying it's because it was rebased or it was not rebased. The reality is that, yes, but the reality is that I handed over, I handed over to the member from Miku South an economy that was strong an economy that had returned to growth and a debt profile that was accommodating, Mr. Speaker. Now, of course, you know why? Because Hurricane Allen took over the reins of the Ministry of Finance. You destroyed it. That's why. That's why I'm telling you, you had that growth rate and you couldn't understand when we on this side drew your attention to the, de I remember the arguments well. When we drew to your attention that the economy was decelerating, huh? when we told you so, you know what the, your, the argument was? Oh, I remember the member, you remember the member for Canary, the member for Ancillary Canaries? He, no, I will not say that word now. He went way back in time to develop a profile that 
we were disasters, but that's the reality, that's what they inherited. Now, let us turn to the former administration led by the member from Miguel South. Listen to this, good news. In 2017, the debt to GDP ratio was 58.8%. You shout, you're shouting out rebase, you'll get in trouble, you know. <laughs> Your fella, you know, hey, you know. <laughs> he shouts, the member for Castries North says rebase. 2018, it climbs slightly, 59.4%. 2019, 60.3%. By 2020, with the onset, with the onset of COVID, Claims to 98.1%. And then in 2021, we see a slight decline to 85.9%. But wait, we haven't even added, I suspect, the drawdowns yet for the Hiwanora International Airport. But leave that alone for the time being. Currently, Mr. Speaker, as we speak, the debt GDP ratio stands at 69.8% according to the pronouncements of the Minister of Finance and what is contained in this so economic and social review. Again, Mr. Speaker, I pause to say that the COVID pandemic took its toll. And no doubt the dramatic increase in the debt to GDP ratio in 2020 was not just the result of heavy borrowing, but also the shrinking of growth in the economy. So two things were occurring. We began to borrow heavily, ostensibly to, ostensibly to finance the fallout from COVID and all of us know what the money was used for and what it was not used for and I leave that for the other members to explore. And at the same time, and at the same time, you also had the shrinking of growth in the economy, ballooning of course your debt to GDP ratio. But I want to make two points, two points. First, the figures show that debt under the SLP was decelerating. That's the reality. Debt under UWP, while initially declining, began accelerating, take off. The take off mode, as the member for Labry would say, the aircraft is at the end of the runway. The engines are revving up in preparation for takeoff. That's what's happening. That's the management of the member for um, Miku South. Secondly, debt GDP ratios change as growth changes. So as the economy returned to growth in 2022, the debt GDP ratios improved and today is recorded at 69.8%. That explains why it is a 69.8%. Now, yes. Let us take a look at the fiscal balances, the, the, third, the third criteria. Mr. Speaker, for your guidance, and that of honorable members, I ask that you took a look at the Economic and Social Review at page 112. For ease of reference, I will only take one criteria on the overall balance. I will not go into um, the other balances. In 2021, the overall balance plunged to minus 12. 112. Overall balance plunged to minus 12%, 12.2%, again the worst in the OECS. Why? I, keep, I leave that question for the jury. Now, Mr. Speaker, against Against that background... Member for Viewed South, you have 10 minutes left. What are you saying, Mrs. Bigo? Exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate doing this, Mrs. Bigo, but I think I'll, I'll want an hour for safety's sake. That journey, that drive... <laughs> Leader of government business. Mr. Speaker, I wish to invoke standing order 3210 to give the honorable member from Beaufort South an extra hour to complete his presentation. Honorable members, the question is that we invoke standing order 3210.
to allow the member of Vivot South an additional 60 minutes in which to conclude his presentation. I now put the question, as many as other opinions say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Please proceed, member. Now, Mr. Speaker, I said that we were looking at page 112, Mr. Speaker. And let us see what the overall balance was for the respective, um, for the respective administrations. The overall balance, then, yes, of the St. Lucia Liberal Party. In 2011 to 2012, it was minus 5.4. In 2012 to 13, it climbed to minus 7.5. Then it began to decline, 2013, 14, minus 4.8. 2014 to 15, minus 2.9. And in 2015, minus 2.2 percent of GDP. And the lesson here is that the member for Migu South inherited one of the lowest fiscal balances ever, ever recorded in St. Lucia since independence, minus 2.2%. That was the inheritance. And then, in 2016-17, one minus 1.5. Climbs to minus two in 2017-18, goes to 1.0 in 2018-19, minus 3.7 in 2019-20, and then plunges, of course, to minus 12.2 in 2021, to 2021, and of course in 21-22, minus 5%. Against that background, Mr. Speaker, let us then look at, if you like, the performance of the current administration and where they are at. Bear in mind, Mr. Speaker, that the current administration is being judged solely on its tenure in two years. It hasn't had five years yet. And we have already noted that the growth rates in 2021 was 12.2% 12 and in 2022 was a whopping 18.1% and we have explained why the growth rates were at that level. We have already pointed out that the overall fiscal balances in 2021 was minus 12.2%, in 2021-22 is down to minus 5.5%. And in 2022-23, minus 1.5 percent. By many, by any stretch of the imagination, no matter what the angle of analysis, this is a phenomenal achievement to have brought your your <clears throat> overall balance down to minus 1.5 percent of GDP. And in 2021, the growth rate was 12.2%. As I said, climbing to 18.1% 22. This performance, as welcome as it is maybe, does not mean that we should rest on our laurels at all. Why? The authors of the Economic and Social Review make the point at page 11 that the real GDP growth rate of 18.1% results in a stock of real GDP being only 1.1% below pre-pandemic levels. So basically, what is happening is that we are catching up with pre-pandemic levels, but we are doing so at a dramatic rate. That's the point. That is the point. This means that we have retrieved the lost ground, and so the economy now returns to normal growth levels. And the performance of the various economic sectors underscores the optimism in the future. Look at the statistics. Strong performance in the tourism sector. 
total visitor arrivals doubled from 301,675 to 736,955 in 2022. Stayover visitor expenditure is estimated to have increased by 86.4% to $2.84 billion in 2022. Value added in the manufacturing sector is estimated to have expanded by 11.4% in 22. Look at page 12 of the review. Rail value in the agricultural sector is estimated to have re recovered partially by 9.8% in 2022. Look at page 12 of the review. And despite the inflationary pressures, the performance in revenue generation signals that the economy is returning to pre-pandemic levels. According to the, social and, to the Economic and Social Review at page 41, available data indicate that total revenue on grants increased by 20.7% to $1,356,600,000, representing an estimated 21.2% of GDP. But there's another key criterion that has to be employed in making this comparison and this measurement. Before we're going to arrive, before we're going to arrive at a conclusion, it is this. Which political party is responsible for the greatest wastages that have occurred in our economy? Now, I have my, they'll tell you I have, I have my sins. They will tell you. First of all, they will shout, Rochabel, Rochabel. And you know, they will shout, Rochabel, Rochabel, Rochabel. <laughs> You shout that. Yes. Yes, my government guaranteed $14.5 million um, to save the Den Hotel. And today, the hundreds were employed there. They'll shout that. They will shout that. The other one they'll shout about is Green Book, but we're reaching a point where we'll be able to talk about that. We ain't far from that. We're getting there. Because I've kept my silence over the years on that issue. But we're getting there, Mr. Speaker. We're getting there. Then, of course, they will tell you about cost overruns and the um, you fought to for a road, a highway. And uh, no matter how you know, Mr. Speaker, those cost overruns were transparent, measured by all and sundry. A commission of inquiry was even set up, set up to investigate cost overruns and blah, 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 blah. You know the history of that. But consider the legacy of the former administration, some which have been itemized on previous debates in this House, and I'm only going to mention some. Look at the Lockerbie contract. Oh my God. 31 million. And I am, I am happy that the people of Beaufort rejected the turf that Lockerbie put elsewhere on other fields. Um, at one time, the default South persons were adamant that no turf of that nature would be placed on its playing field in default. We have already explored the construction, the alternative hospital, the construction of the box. 118 million has gone, and God knows how much more is going to go into that box for the foreseeable future, but 118 million dollars has gone down the drain. Then, of course, the payment of the money to range. The Minister of Finance has already pointed out the cost overruns of, I believe, $40 million U.S. on piles, isn't it U.S.? On piles for the new terminal building at Iwanora. We have the payment of the U.S. $7 million for COVID vaccines. And Mr. Speaker, then we have the $4.6 million, $4.6 million to Narayan for commissioning the OKU EU hospital. As I said, there's a seven million for radical investment, the Lockerbie 32 million, and who can ever forget the payment of three million dollars to Ernest and Young for budget preparation. Who can ever forget those things? All attributable, and I'm not going to get personal and mention anything about hotel room and how much hotel room costs, Mr. Speaker. You see, Mr. Speaker, See this man here, I used to get a lot of pressure from my cabinet, you know, Mr. Speaker. A lot of pressure. And I don't say this in any malice, I'll tell you this. There was a rule in my cabinet that all members, 
travel economy class. If on the arrival at the airport of the Prime Minister that the airline wanted to upgrade the Prime Minister, they upgrade the Prime Minister. And I, had, I have often had the indignity. They would give me an upgrade from Himanora International Airport to my destination, but when you see I'm coming back, crap will smoke my pipe. Woe be unto me if I travel on British Airways. Oh Woe be. British Airways don't know anything about upgrade. But I would say that the other airline was a little kinder in that regard and often made sure that they provided an, uh, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Virgin. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to go into the specifics, but I will also tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the members of my cabinet were furious that they had to travel um, in the economy and they would tease when there were moments of levity in the cabinet how, Mr. and I'm not talking out of cabinet, they would tease how they would have to sit next to the toilets in the long flats, <laughs> in the long flights. Yeah. I didn't have the luxury that the former, the former member had. I never had credit card to use in my life. So when you look at all of this, what is the verdict do you draw? Do I have to spell out the verdict? Do you have to spell out the verdict? Surely the answer is pellucidly clear, absolutely clear. What more variation, what more argument do you want? The St. Lucia Labour Party has been beyond now the best manager of the St. Lucia economy by far. We have always been courageous and never resigned from taking the tough but right actions with the economy. People know my views on VAT. I made statements about VAT. I did not recoil when a day came and it had to be implemented. And my goodness, remember the blows that I took for it? That's what matters. You gotta be courageous. And when the times come so you to make powerful and strong decisions for your country, you mustn't be afraid. You have to do it for your country because your country. Now, having said all of this, Mr. Speaker, and having answered the question and responded to this political myth that the United Workers' Party is a better manager of the Indonesian economy, I want to look at the overall picture and share with honorable distinguished colleagues two concerns. I have identified two concerns, but in my view, none are insurmountable challenges. The first is the decline in construction activities. We are told in the Social and Economic Review at page 13 that real value added in the construction sector is estimated to have declined in 2022 by 12.6% due to reduced activity in both the public and private sectors, partly influenced by additional price increases and periodic shortages of imported materials. I do not accept that these are all or the most plausible explanations for this decline. I think that the authors of the Economic and Social Review are rather conservative in the explanations that they offered. But I am confident that with the planned program of works announced in this budgetary cycle, that construction will retain and resume its buoyancy in due course. Investment in construction is always the easiest and quickest way to excite growth and at the same time to bring peace and comfort in your community and your in country. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? What this is showing is that the real important thing is that there is room in the economy for ex expansion and for investment. And so financing construction is key to nudging growth in the short term. But I want to urge the administration to keep a close eye on the public sector because the public sector will have to play a part for this to happen, to excite 
to excite increased construction activity. We should not deny construction activity because we want to reduce expenditure on the capital balances to ensure that the fiscal balances appear to be maintained. The reality is that since your economy is returning to normal growth, you need to grow that economy and then you need movement in construction to let that economy grow in the short term. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. As I said, Mr. Speaker, the, the government will have to watch the public sector very closely. Projects like the Cultural Center and the Administrative Center for Viewfort must not suffer the same fate as the last time and left to the closing days of the parliamentary term. I expect my administrative complex and cultural center to be built in quick time. Because really, you must be talking about $80 million in the economy. Yeah, quite easily. It was $60 million pre-COVID, and now, and now understand that after COVID, it will necessarily grow. My second area of concern is the banking sector. Now, I had thought that a member for Sozel Solivers would have lectured us a little bit on the banking sector. Right. Now, I don't know about your meeting about banking sector. I'm concerned with what is written in this economic and social report. According to the economic and social review at page 15, Mr. Speaker, the financial sector remained stable in 2020 and in line with the economic rebound, there was increased commercial lending to the wholesale and retail sector for land and infrastructure development and for real estate purposes, unquote. The review says liquidity remains high. Credit to the private sector grew marginally by 1.6% in 2022. Banks are lending, therefore, with greater confidence, albeit cheaply. Mr. Speaker, these are welcome indicators. All good news. Good news indeed. However, there are some cautionary notes that we must take heed. Three may be noted. The first is the disclosure that higher levels of liquidity are prompting banks to continue to invest abroad. While this has happened in the past and this is nothing new, its continuation in these terms is bound to be concerning. Because really, really that money should be diverted to this domestic economy at this time. Because the banks have a shared interest with the government of St. Lucia to see that the economy grows. They are vital to the growth in this economy. The second is the fact that despite the apparent increase in deposits, credit growth remained tepid, thus leading to a buildup of excess liquidity in the system. The review puts it this way, and I'm quoting from the review, Mr. Speaker. Quote, deposits continue to trend upward in the commercial banking system and credit growth remain tepid due to structural impediments which influence cautious lending policies leading to a further buildup of excess liquidity. So, the reality is, even though people suffered immeasurably during COVID, even though we had to face moratoria for our loans, but the counter to that was that liquidity was in fact building up in the banking system to the point that we now have in excess liquidity and the banks are exporting money to invest over abroad, to invest abroad. That's, that's the reality of all of this. The second cautionary note is, um, the third cautionary note is this, quote, bank asset liquidity deteriorated as the non-performing loan ratio rose further from 13.8% in December 2021 to 14.2% in December 22. Now this cannot be alarming. It cannot be alarming, Mr. Speaker, for the very simple reason that with the onset of COVID and the adjustments in COVID, this was almost inevitable. However, the authors of the review do not, unfortunately, identify these so-called structural impediments. 
But I suspect we know what they are trying to refer to. We all know that these impediments include the legal challenges of dealing with toxic, toxic loans and assets. I suspect, Attorney General, that's what they're talking about. I say this, Mr. Speaker. I believe that the time has come to deal with the issue of toxic assets within the banking system. And the government needs to be facilitated by creating a more accommodating legal framework to allow banks greater flexibility in dealing with distressed loans. And I'm not suggesting the ECCB model because that model is, is totally irrelevant to our needs and purposes and could, should be discarded at the earliest opportunity. Tell the central bank I said so, if you, if you, if you have doubts. Too many homes are empty, seized by banks, and remain in their possession distressed. Mr. Speaker, when I drive through Cedar Heights in Beaufort, I am shocked by the number of homes that are just closed, empty, deteriorating. Why? They're distressed assets from toxic loans. And what do they do? They cast a huge shadow over the community. It's a serious issue. We need to go further and allow banks more flexibility in selling those assets as happened when Ascendancy Limited purchased toxic loans from the Bank of Nova Scotia before its hurried departure from our shores after years of goodwill and loyalty. And nobody likes me to talk about the Canadian banks and how they treated the people of St. Lucia. So I would rather use the diplomatic language that I use, Mr. Speaker, and say, after their hurried departure from our shores, after years of goodwill and loyalty, maybe that will bring across the point a little more delicately and will not cause any undue anxiety on the part of those who send me messages after I make those statements. The appearance of ascendancy on the market, Mr. Speaker, has in some instances allowed some refinancing of distressed loans. And this is what the banks refuse to do, engage previously loyal customers to restructure their loans, to refinance their loans, and perhaps what we need to do is to create a legal framework and a, and a legal environment that allows, the, that allows the introduction of new entities to handle some of these toxic loans. As I maintain, Mr. Speaker, banks must be encouraged to do more by way of refinancing distressed loans. But to all of this, there must be one overriding caveat. The time has come to protect consumers of banking services. Self-regulation by banks cannot and do not do work, do the work. Not anymore. We cannot rely on the banks to self-regulate themselves in the interest of consumers, they will simply not do it. All they're interested in is new legislation for credit risk so that it makes it e easier for them to approve or disapprove a loan application. There continue to be serious issues about how customers are treated by these banks. I have raised this before. Consumers cannot look to the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to provide protection. There's too much of a history there. I have championed a legislative framework that clearly specifies the rights and the entitlements of consumers. This framework could make provision for the appointment of what I describe as a bond, as a, sorry Mr. Speaker, a banking ombudsman to hear and determine complaints by consumers. Mr. Speaker, it cannot be right or acceptable for banks simply to ignore complaints by consumers, even when those complaints come from lawyers, compelling lawyers to turn to the courts for redress. That should not happen. But yet, it is a frequent occurrence in the banking sector. But these are areas of concern that I have selected from this social and economic review because I think we need to think about it. But I'll say this to you, Mr. Speaker. No matter what criticisms may be leveled at this budget by its distractors, there can be no question that this is a budget with a soul. 
It has a soul. Consider, Mr. Speaker, the following. Extension of the tax amnesty for another year. Waiver of all penalties, interests, and fines if taxes are paid by May 1st, 2024. No withholding tax on payments on contracts 10,000 and below. I might have wanted to increase that to $15,000 and below. PV components to be zero rated for value added tax. The cost of installing a PV system will be allowed as an income tax deductible expense. Rebate of a dollar per gallon on fuel for registered fishers. Promise kept. One hour payment of 600 for government pensioners. Increase in the one time allowance for t to teachers to purchase teaching materials from $600 to $1,100 and increase of $500. And how well I remember that one off payment. I must say there's a lot of generosity. A lot of generosity. Where's the Minister of Education? He must have um, prevailed for this increase to have, to have obtained. But that is an interesting increase. Removal of 12.5% VAT on specified building materials for a period of two years. And I must welcome this because the former administration that I led did the same thing. And what, are this, what colorful stories emerged from that episode? A lot of colorful stories, but certainly welcome. An extension of duty rebate on vehicles to customs and correctional officers for one year. When these benefits are considered, alongside the benefits itemized by the Minister of Finance at pages 8 and 9 of his budget presentation, which I shall not review at this time, Speaker. Then I have to say that while this continued generosity is commendable, unprecedented, unprecedented, and perhaps necessary in these times, the question could well be asked whether we are not deepening and entrenching this culture of dependency in our society. That's the thing that worries me. It is that philosophical outcome. It is worrying me, Mr. Speaker. But let us leave that for the political sociologists to consider and uh, debate another time. So, this, with all this generosity, how can one take umbrage by the decision to impose, quote, a health and security levy of 2.5% on goods and services except on food items, medicines, selected building materials, building equipment, and security equipment? Increase the excise tax on tobacco, a known killer, by 50%. Why should the opposition want to make that an issue and go back to the old political myths? You see why I spoke about political myths? That the Labour government is a taxing government. That's the myth. And I'm sorry I didn't deal with that particular myth up, upwards in this presentation, the so-called taxing in government, but we'll come to that, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, at the appropriate time. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the shame of the poor quality of our health services need to be resolved once and for all. We carry a shame in this country because of our poor health services and no offense meant to the minister and his staff because he is trying exceedingly hard, but the reality is that we do not have a health service that we can be proud of, and we must correct this mistake. We cannot continue, Mr. Speaker, to beg other countries to pay for health services for our people. When will the trek to Martinique and the trek to Cuba and the trek to Barbados and the trek to Trinidad end for our sent citizens? And our citizens need to understand someone has to pay for health care. If you want it, you have to invest in it. The poor people of our country cannot continue to suffer the indignity of access to health care simply because they cannot afford it. We have to bring an end to it. Mr. Speaker, you know as well as I know that this health cost of health Healthcare has skyrocketed. Mr. Speaker, understand that there are medications costing $200, even $500, for one tablet to treat certain medical conditions, Mr. Speaker. And further, it is impossible for politicians to be financiers of healthcare for their constituents. Nobody in this house has the capacity to do so. But of course, if any of you have secrets that I don't know about, share it with me. Tell me how I can cope with it. I don't know. I don't know. 
Tell me how I can cope with it. The secret is broke. That cannot be right. But we all know what the problem is. True, we have the issues of personnel and management in the health services. But the fundamental problem has always been availability of resources. That has been the issue in health. We have the doctors. We have the nurses. We have the facilities. The problem is that we cannot finance our health care. That's the crux of the problem. Make no mistake about it. A levy of 2.5% will not cure all of our problems. But it is a start. An important start and the government deserves and needs support for it. Tell the opposition. Wear blindfold and support it. Tell them stop squandering the health of this, the people of this nation. When VAT was reduced by 2.5% by the former government, it dealt a severe blow to revenue generation to support the delivery of key government services, including health. That was the effect of that. They were busy beating themselves on the chest, we reduced VAT. Mind you, they had promised Mr. Speaker to abolish VAT yeah. and talked about sales tax. But they reduced it by 2.5%. To this day, nobody felt the impact of the reduction by 2.5%. If anything, mass increased the prices in the supermarkets. <laughs> they couldn't even defend it. And mind you, they had more influence on mass, I suspect, than we did at the time, but who knows? <laughs> they used to say five to stay alive, but I used to say five to die dead. <laughs> Remember that famous phrase, I die dead? That's my dear friend. My dear friend. But I used to say, five to die dead. And when, and when we reduced VAT, what did we do? We simply replaced this loss of revenue by more borrowing. Speaker, this cannot continue. Let us face the problem and deal with it. I have only one right, of Mr. Speaker, one consideration. My only issue, Mr. Speaker, is that consideration should be given to creating a dedicated mechanism to manage the revenue generated to service health costs. I am certainly not proposing another lockbox mechanism. I don't even want to hear that word. Perhaps we can create a medical investment board, an MIB, so that solutions can be satisfied that the revenue generated by this levy is used for the purpose that is intended and for their benefit. And I believe that this is something that should be considered. Let us create a medical investment board that the consolidated fund, the Accountant General, is directed that every dollar that is raised by this levy goes straight into that board. I don't know, I, the Minister of Finance in his wisdom attached security but maybe that needs rationalization. To be honest with you, I would much have preferred just a health levy on its own, but that's neither here nor there. I'm not bothering to go there. All I'm saying is that if we can prove to St. Lucians that this dedicated levy is for their good and welfare, for their health, for the country as a whole, then I'm sure that their justification will be even greater. Now, Mr. Speaker, the good news is that I am I'm descending and getting ready to, 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 to land. <laughs> I have circulated, Mr. Speaker, and now I am descending to my correct level. And, and, and Mr. Speaker, I have always been a co-pilot, um, um, co-pilot in the, the, the the, the uh, cabin of the member for 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 library south and of course he speaks often of his final approach so mr speaker in my final approach i want to consider some things in my constituency but let me start on perhaps a, a note of some a note of some disappointment some took umbrage at my comments when we debated the estimates of revenue and expenditure in the defense and protection of my constituents and even had the temerity to say 
that they wondered aloud whether I was never the Prime Minister of this country to do what I am now asking the government to do for the fourth South. I'm not going to name names or identify individuals who made those comments. They know themselves and they heard me loud and clear. And those, of course, who supported them in making those statements. Well, you know, I too wondered aloud whether these individuals were not aware that an administrative center whose construction was started by the government which I led was deliberately stopped and cancelled by the former government. So what are you talking about? Yes. I wondered too whether I failed to remember that on two occasions in 2011 and 2016, in 2006 and 2016, Work had commenced to grant ownership of the lands of Bruceville to the people of Bruceville only to be stopped and shelled by an incoming UW administration. So some of the things I asked for is nothing new. The difference being I asked it from the back benches. That's the difference. I will make it absolutely clear that I will defend, protect and advance the interests of my constituency no matter how much discomfort my comments may cause. As a member of Acastris East often used to say on the political platform, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> my constituents deserve no less. They have supported me for 25 years. Like they have supported the member for Castries East. Every single parliamentarian in this house speak for his or her constituency. Why should it be different from me because I happen to be an ex-prime minister? And when I spoke at the debate on the estimates of, my, of revenue and expenditure, I set out the agenda for my constituency. I said then, that in any debate on the estimates of revenue and expenditure, a parliamentary backbencher has three bites of the cherry to plead for his constituency. The first is to identify programs for his or her constituency in the estimates of revenue and expenditure, as presented. The second bite occurs when the ministers speak and address plans, hopefully, for the members' constituency, so you listen to them. And the third comes with a budgetary statement itself. And I said I will await the icing on the cake. And, Mr. Speaker, I have not been disappointed. I have seen the icing on the cake. And the Minister of Finance deserves thanks and commendation. He listened, he understood, he delivered. I can do no better than repeat what the Minister of Finance has announced for you've heard South at page 34 of his presentation. I do so because I have a few comments. One, identification of available land for resettlement. Two, dialogue with the owners of land in the town of Beaufort to empower home ownership. Three, enactment of legislation to convert Proud into a statutory corporation in which land will be vested. Four, psychosocial support for residents to deal with trauma, earth social recovery, and enhance economic well-being. In this regard, the government will work closely with the NGO community. Five, the establishment of information desks by specified ministries to provide help and guidance to citizens who access government services. For example, the Ministry of Commerce will establish a presence to assist citizens to access small business loans. Six, special economic educational, special economic educational and sports programs at, for at-risk groups. Seven, construction of an administrative complex and a cultural center for the people of Yefo and the South within the term. This will fulfill a promise made to the people of Yefo during the 2021 campaign, end of quote. I want to just say, Mr. Speaker, some of these proposals require explanations or amplification. First is the land issue in the town of Beaufort. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't wish to be misunderstood because you know how easy it is to be misunderstood. Mr. Speaker, this is, the intent here is not something new. I have always said that Beaufortians, the people of Beaufort, do not own their community. They don't have assets in land. They don't own the land. Most of them are renting or squatting on land that don't belong to them in the town. The principal landlords 
it's the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and one or two private persons in, in, in the man. What this is proposing is, is really a discussion with the churches to say to them, to ask them to consider whether if they wish, they are willing to sell those lands to the state, not for the state to take over lands. The state will not take over any lands, but if they want to sell those lands to the state, and the state will then rationalize the lands and make it available to the residents of the fort. This is what it is all about. And so, I'm hoping that in the coming weeks there will be some engagement. If the churches say, no, that's the end of the matter, that goes no further, it dies there. The second is the construction of an administrative and cultural center for the people of Ufort. I can assure this honorable house that the people of Ufort welcome the announcement, particularly not just of the admi administrative center, but of the cultural center. This has been a dream for years, for years. Our artists in the South deserve a, deserve a home. No Calypso tent has produced as, so many, as many kings and queens as the South Calypso tent, and this year the same will happen. Our Calypsonians need a home. This discrimination has to end. This allocation of all the facilities in the North has to end. The member for library, the member for library has an HR, HRDC. I remember, it was constructed during my tenure, but before can't even shout about HRDC. Every little community has an HRDC. I said to the Minister of Finance, make haste, let a plan, build the cultural center. <laughs> there must be no delay on that matter. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, I am descending rapidly. I know that the roads of Ufort South were not mentioned by the Minister of Finance. The residents of Cantonment, La Ressource and Cedar Heights have understandably expressed their disappointment to me. Last Wednesday was rough in my constituency. But I believe that their pleas are not in vain and have been heard. I believe that some attention will be given to these roads this financial year. Mr. Speaker, I have noted carefully the proposed social interventions in Default South in the wake of the killings announced by the Minister of Finance. These days, there are many actors in Default South. I thank all. I appreciate the presence of all of them. I have malice towards none. But it seems to me that to avoid duplication, uncertainty, and chaos on the ground, it is absolutely vital to convene as a first step a meeting of all the NGOs who are likely to be involved in the community in the days ahead. Roles and responsibilities must be defined and allocated. I want no surprises in my constituency. I don't want anybody I, whom I don't know working in my constituency. So it is important that all are coming to that. That is just before landing. I'm coming to that. I think it is vital, Mr. Speaker, absolutely vital, Mr. Speaker, that a meeting of all these NGOs be convened at the soonest. Finally, Mr. Speaker, before I leave my constituency and close, let me touch on the issue of the Viewfort Port. Mr. Speaker, I welcome the following statement of the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance at pages 50 to 51 of his budget receipt. Quote, I can assure St. Lucians that there is no agreement to exclude cruise sport development in Viewfort. In fact, we are currently discussing various options for the, for the development of cruise tourism in Viewfort. Unquote. Mr. Speaker, this statement puts to the lie the state statement of the member from Migu South, and I'm sorry he's not there, that there was an agreement between Global Ports Holding and the government of St. Lucia that its investment in port castries and Soufre was to, to the exclusion of any port development in Beaufort South. I wish I could, could explain to honorable members what I endured and suffered after that statement by the member from Migu South. Everybody in the Fort South wanted to find out how is it 
that I could have allowed a government of which I am a backbencher to sign an agreement that excludes port development in Ivoire. I mean, I even called the Minister of Tourism about this matter, so concerned that I was, and I told him he had to issue a statement or suggested to me as issue a statement. I don't know if he took it seriously, but it was a serious matter. So, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance has made it absolutely clear that is not the case. As I said, the statement was even more egregious, and I'm referring to the statement of, of the member from Mugu South, because it was elected as parliamentary representative, I allowed this to happen without a whiff of protest. But you know, Mr. Speaker, this is not the first sin of the member of Miku South in my constituency. The member's sins in Viewfort are legendary. There are many. And I'm not even going to engage in too many specifics. We all know that lands in Viewfort was given away literally for next to nothing to Tiwa King for his fanciful development. We all know that. Both says you farm is no more. The meat processing plant no longer exists. The abattoir is gone. We spend millions to transport garbage from before to Diglo. Incinerators were imported and none of them were in use at millions. And I forgot to include that in my statement on wastage. The lives of the cattle farmers of Viewfort were destroyed. Never again will Viewfort be the chief supplier of cattle to Bexo and to Mark. Never again. Never ever again. The, the lives were destroyed. We have had to contend in Viewfort with the fiasco of St. Jude. And only recently, Mr. Speaker, during the members' walkabout in Viewfort with one shine, <laughs> he was reminded by the young men of Bruceville that his actions destroyed their horse racing interests and activities. I was not alone. And you know, pictures on their own can tell quite a story because you see all the little youths gather around and this, high head, this one head touching and so on. You know what I mean? And, and so on. All these things happening, Mr. The speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I find that rough. <laughs> yes, Mr. Speaker. All these things happen, but there's also a danger in this because they record you. And you heard, you heard a young man saying to the member of Amigo South, but you stop our horse racing, which Kenny Anthony had started for us and had done every year. But, yes, but, but, but Mr. Speaker, I want you to hear this. You know, Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious matter, and this explains some of the current difficulty and trauma that I have. If these young men had been allowed to continue horse racing, the one interest of many of them, because that was their sole interest, they may have stayed away from the gangs that have inflicted so much pain and trauma on the people of the force. Now I don't know if I can touch them. We are trying hard, Mr. Speaker, to see if we can let, encourage Slasper just to let us use a little piece of land, a little bit of horse racing to bring some relief to these young men, to begin at least to say to them that there are people who care for them. And that's the trauma of you fought. They feel people don't care, others don't care. That's the reality. But come to think of it, Mr. Speaker. The time has come to place the ownership of what remains of the horse racing track, which the member from Miku South once said will never return a profit, in the hands of the government and people of St. Lucia by negotiation or otherwise. It is time that that horse racing track be handed over to St. Lucians 
And if your walking has any decency, he'll say, Truk. He'll say, No, sorry, I probably let me put it this way. I said, I'm not putting it in the past then. He'll say, Take, look it, it belongs to you. You run it. Point, I'll help him. I would even help him with the Creole, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and maybe the member for Miku South should do the people of St. Lucia service and tell the T.O.R. King, give the horse racing track back to the people of St. Lucia and finish it up. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Speaker. If the member for Miku South cannot produce irrefutable proof of his allegation about the port in default south then given the damage that it has caused to me in my constituency he should apologize to me in person and in public and to the people of default south the honorable member mr speaker has inflicted enough pain and damage on the people of the Fort South. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I have nothing further to add.